Okay, so um, as far as do not ghost, I wanted to ask people, how did you form your religious beliefs? Okay, I'm gonna turn off lights actually so people can actually see what's going on <coughs> because a lot of my screens are dark today. How did you form your religious beliefs? Um, it was partially family and um, like my own experiences. What does family look like? Like, how does that? How do they force you into religion, or how did you come into religion by family? So like. So like I was forced to go to church, mm -hmm. and then I would go to church and I would learn from there. Mm -hmm. But then I would take what they taught me in church, and then I would interpret it in my own way. Definitely, yeah. Often see that. My mom, well, not my mom, my grandma. My grandma. Mm -hmm. She um, when I call her, she's like, "Oh, God is um, this, this, and that. Mm -hmm. He's he does this, this, and that for it for us." Okay. And so kind of hearing that in your ear all the time slowly yeah. convinced you. Um, yeah, Ethan, um, the little cat. Um, ever since I was a baby, I was being dragged to church. Um, so as in, you're going to get in that seat, you're going to drive in the car with us, and you don't have a choice. I will buckle you in myself. Yeah, I don't have a choice. It, it de <laughs> it's either get dragged to church or stay alone in the house, which mm -hmm. is fine by me. Okay. But but they but they obviously don't let me do that. And then also, ever since ever since I was a baby, I only learned to speak English, and that's it. Like, see, my like, I don't have I don't have a, a Spanish accent. Yeah. I speak like a white person. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> sorry. And something to apologize for. And um, every time I go to church, the whole church is Spanish, mm -hmm. so I have no idea what they're saying, and I am obviously. So you're a little lost. I'm lost, and I'm, and I'm going to be obligated to just get, get distracted. Interesting. Okay, Kat's last comment, and we got to move on here. Sorry, for now. Unfortunately, um, I don't get dragged to church, so it's mm -hmm. not really a, a main priority in my family. But we do have, like, symbols around the house uh, yeah. with God on it. Because my mom's always the type of person, because I have to say, how come we don't go to church? And she says that um, you don't have to go to church to believe in God. So as long as you believe in God, that's all right. Right, and Elizabeth, I'm going to hold on just so we can move on, but that's a kind of a perfect segue. Um, today we start a new unit. You had Middle Ages, where you kind of learned about the rise and fall of the church, right? We knew good things were happening, we knew bad things were happening. Um, you get Renaissance, where we completely, church loses all power. And then we get to this Reformation. And before we even start, um, break this part up for me. Break this word up. What is, like, the main word in this in this phrase? Someone call it out. Reform. Reform. Good, right? So that so Reformation, reform is the word. So what do we think reform means? Right, with hands. Yeah, Lois. Um, new ideas. Um, like new ways to do things. Okay, so new ways to do things. Um, another way. Someone help us out. So new ways to do things, new ways. To, what's, what else, Nathaniel? Changing, changing something up. Good, so you're changing it up, right? You're fixing it up. And that's what we're going to learn, right? The Reformation is this period of change. And that's what we're going to see. Um, so here's where we started off. Um, Church authority is challenged by the Renaissance. If you're moving periods, right, we start with the Renaissance, we started with the Middle Ages, where church is so important, right? Church is part of your everyday life. Then all of a sudden, you've got individualism, you've got humanism, you've got secularism. And you see, this all starts to challenge the church. And not only the church, but how much power the church has. And even, not only the people, but also rulers, right? Kings are like, wait a second. The church might not have as much power as I think they do. I did figure out how to turn off the heat, though. I broke it. Do we manage it? Um, question? Okay. All right, more about church's authority being challenged. Um, we have our printing press. And this printing press we um, found out about during the Renaissance with a raised hand um, printing press. Who, who created it? Raised hand. Surrender, what do we got? Johann Gutenberg. Yeah, we have Johann Gutenberg. Um, JG, for the, um, so I'm not going to write it out. We have Johann Gutenberg um, creating this printing press, and it spreads this I these ideas. So if you think about it, you know, if Kalasia wants to talk smack about Arlene, right now, in order to let the whole family know about it, she has to write 25 notes, and she has to handwrite these. Well, now, instead, she can take them to Johann Gutenberg, she gives them the note, 
she presses it down 25 times, and all of a sudden, all she has to do is pass that out. And we saw through our simulation two weeks ago how easy it is to pass out that piece of paper and get it done. Um, well, the same thing happens with talking smack about the church, right? If you want to spread humanistic ideas, right, promoting um, yourself over religion, it's so easy to do now that we have the printing press. Yes? Uh, when you said, once you said that about the self thing, Promoting yourself over yeah. religion? Yeah, I was watching a movie called uh, Life of Pi. I love that movie, yes. And um, it went, uh, at one point when, he, when he's on the sea, he, like, right there, he, bring, he gives himself to God. Mm -hmm. He's and like, oh, I'm your, yours, just take me already. Mm -hmm. and that's what I thought about. Him. So is he promoting himself or is he promoting religion? He's promoting himself. He's like, promoting religion. Is he promoting, so in that, right, I give myself to God, but is he promoting self or promoting self. religion? It's more about religion, because you're giving yourself over to religion. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the um, raising taxes, right? The northern merchants start to hate all the taxes that are coming in, and they're not finding it fair. Um, we also have some criticisms, all right? We've got corrupt leaders. We've got extravagant popes, meaning these popes are spending tons of money on things that they don't need. Today, this would be like if the Pope bought a red Ferrari and, um, and you know, bought not one chain, but two chains. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's so funny today. Um, right, by, buying, like, by buying a lot of, um, of goods that you don't need. So, like, instead of just buying, like, one gold chain, you buy two chains. Right? Like, oh, that, was my, that was my funny joke for today. Um, so if you take a look, this is one of my favorite political cartoons because I think it's very entertaining. Um, what? Where is this normally seen? With the hand. Where is this? Hold on, with the hand. Catherine. In the Sistine Chapel. So normally we see this with um, in the Sistine Chapel, but Catherine, why, why is it different? Because of the lights. Yeah. Um, someone else besides Catherine. Who are these two hands supposed to be? With a hand. Who are these? Los, what do we got? Oh, one of them is God. Good. And Adam. And Adam. So this is supposed to be a religious um, picture, correct? Yes. You've got yeah. you've, you have right. And you've seen it in that. I yeah, you normally see it really big. So instead, instead you have God and Adam exchanging money, right? Showing corruptedness. That money is now a part of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. We know that money shouldn't be important if if you're talking about religion. And so this is, right, we see them starting to cause a lot of troubles, right? And also, priests um, are poorly educated. Right? If you think you're a priest, you should be able to be a great reader, right? But what else do you need to be able to do? If you're a priest, not only read the Bible, what else do you have to be able to do? Talk, preach. What do you do when you read a text? What do you have to do next? Analyze, explain, right? So if your priest is poorly educated, can they critically analyze the Bible? No. Right? That's a little concerning. So this is some of the criticism that goes on. And I might have to change. Can people see this or no? No. Okay. Yes. I can change it to make it white. Sure, guys. Um, all right. So there were people um, during the Middle Ages who actually are already promoting this reform, this change. And um, these guys were John Wycliffe and Jan Hus. Right, so we've already, we already know these guys. These guys are people we've already heard about. Um, which one gets burned? Someone called out? Well done. Almost the whole class called it out. Lovely. We've got Jan Hus. And um, these people are saying, you know what? Bible's so much more important than the clergy. And with the hand, with the hand, uh, what does clergy mean? Hands. Let's see. Lynn. Church officials. Yeah, church officials or church people, however you want to write. Right? People who work in the church. Pope. So the Pope, the Priest. priests, the friars. Adrian, stop showing off. Um, um, all right, a great image for those of you who like math, a great way to think about this, and I've, I've shown you this before, think about fractions, right? Even if you're someone who's a very visual person, um, hi, Bible over <laughs> priests, right? The Bible needs to go first. This is more important. So every reform that's happened so far is saying that the Bible is way more important than the person who reads the Bible. And I think a lot of you, especially if you're religious today, you agree, right, that this actual document is way more important than someone who analyzes the document. Okay, so, um, and this is at the bottom of your page. I apologize if it's a little blurry. Some of yours are, some of yours are not. Um, you had two other reformers who had already talked about trying to fix the church. You have Erasmus and you have Thomas More. 
and I and I wanted to make sure that people um, had kind of the background on them because we'd already learned about them. So I wrote it in for you. Thomas More wants a utopia where the church has no evil and vices. And then Erasmus is saying, church, stop abusing your power, right? Don't abuse your power. People in the church shouldn't abuse uh, the power. And he wants popes, cardinals, and bishops to go back to how it used to be when everything was perfect. Yeah. Um, a way to think about, normally, um, the utopia in Thomas More is easy to memorize, correct? More or less, yeah? Erasmus is a little bit more difficult, so I kind of want to walk through this. Um, if Alphonsina is a priest, all right? You are a priest, congratulations. And Alphonsina, you guys go to church every week. You know Alphonsina. She has been teaching you about the Bible since you were all very little. And one day she comes up and she says, um, you know, in the Bible today, I read that SpongeBob <coughs> is Jesus' cousin. And we need to worship SpongeBob just the way that um, we worship Jesus. And while today you guys think that's really whack, like that's crazy, because you've trusted Alphonsina and her word of God for so long that you actually start to worship Spongebob, mm. all right, which is just kind of crazy to think about today. <laughs> and so Erasmus is really promoting, he says, we need priests and we need popes and we need friars and bishops to all go back to when, you know, they were really just focused on the Bible instead of creating their own interpretation. Um, with this information, um, I'm going to let you know, there is a difference between identification and um, memorization. Yeah, you're saying job, but a lot of people don't know this. Um, with this information, these two bullet points, um, identification or memorization, what do you think? With these two ideas, memorization or identification? identification. Someone explain why. Why are these things you have to identify versus memorize? Yeah. Because you don't have to say exactly that what you wrote. You can say simply Thomas More wanted a utopia, and Erasmus wanted leaders to stop church leaders to stop abusing their power. Yeah, if I cover up Thomas More and I say, oh yeah, there was this man who wanted a utopia in which the church is it just identifying that it's Thomas More? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Whereas if I cover it up, hey, talk about Thomas More. That's memorization. I don't need you memorizing this information. I just need you identify that these are two people that really promoted reform. All right, the last idea, right? The last cause of the Reformation right now goes back to that Gutenberg Bible, right? And Gutenberg printing press. That as people read religious works, they form their own opinions. And this is very crucial, right? Forming your own opinions. As you learn to read, you form your own opinions of what's going on. to the other side when you're ready. Um, Alright, so this is when notes start to get fairly confusing. So I want to make sure we break down especially this slide really, really well. So I'm actually going to give people a minute and a half, write down what you need to write down, and then we're actually going to talk through this. This slide I will let you know is probably one of the most important slides you're going to see today. So, um, I will let you know, at this point, we have a friar. Remember, friar is part of the clergy, and his name is Johann Tetzel. Kind of like pretzel, but not. Um, and Johann Tetzel is a friar who works in a church, and he starts selling these indulgences. And for those of you who haven't heard this story, right, an indulgence is a pardon releasing a person from the penalties of sin, which sounds very confusing, correct? So here's how this is going to work. All right, um... Martin Luther sees this all happening. So here's what, a, here's what an indulgence is. Um, T.T. does something absolutely terrible. Someone to make up something that T.T.'s done that's absolutely terrible. It can be a lie. He killed yeah. Um, all right. T.T. has murdered Kalasia. This is a terrible, terrible thing. All right. But T.T. knows if he goes to the church, he can get a pardon. So he goes, and we'll have Lynn be our friar. He goes up to Lynn and he says, I've done something bad. And Lynn goes, what have you done? He says, I murdered Kalasia. I was very angry and I murdered her. And she thinks, right, as the friar, she goes, okay, murder's a pretty big deal. If you give me 50 gold coins, I will give you a piece of paper that says you're forgiven for your sin. 
So TT is like, this is awesome. I'm a wealthy man, right? I have 50 coins. Here you go. Gives them to Lynn. Lynn gives him a piece of paper saying, you are forgiven from all sins. You can still go to heaven. Okay. Okay. What? So TT so goes home. <laughs> He's got his nice little piece of paper. He no longer feels guilty. Kalita, sorry, you're dead, bud. Tough luck, right? TT's happy. Next day, TT does something else. He doesn't do something like killing someone, something a little less. He steals, he steals, he steals an apple from a child. Apple. And he goes, well, <clears throat> does that still count? I have my piece of paper saying I'm forgiven from the <clears throat> sin of killing Kalasia, but I've just stolen. And I know in the Ten Commandments it says, thou shalt not kill, or thou shalt not steal. So I need to go back. I go back to Lynn and said, I accidentally did something. I, I stole an apple. And Lynn goes, stealing's part, like, not allowed. You know, in the Bible it says it's not allowed. Um, please give me three gold coins. He's like, this is even awesomer, right? Three coins, no big deal. Gets the coins, gets his piece of paper, he goes home. He now has two pieces of paper, he has those indulgences, and he's still going to heaven. So what does it encourage people to do? Manny. It encourages people to like, walk around committing crimes and then feeling like they can get away with it if they have money. And who ends up being very corrupt in this situation? Church. The, the church. church, right? Because now the church has tons of money. And the people believe, well, it's okay if I do something bad because I just have to pay for forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah, it's like um, them thinking that they could do something and then it's like nothing. So it's like going around, committing mm -hmm. crimes, and then going to church. And, yeah. and I'm going to put it in terms that you guys might understand today. Um, if, um, who has a brother or sister here? Yes. All right, so for Chelsea, Chelsea, if someone killed brother or sister? Um. Both. Okay. No, I said bro. Oh, Maybe brother. Brother. Bro. Homie bro. Um, <laughs> we, if, okay, if someone kills your brother, let's be serious. You might not like them all the time, but you do love yeah. them. Is any amount of money going to bring him back? No. No, right? So accepting that type of money, right, you wouldn't want this. Today, right, back then, we have this idea that money takes away all the bad things you've done, right? And so this is just doesn't happen today, right? The same way you can't pay off a cop. Right, it's illegal to pay off a cop for a, something you do that's not correct. Right? We're talking about right here. So this is so Martin Luther, and this is our big figure for today. Listen, guys, you got to stay focused. Turn, turn, please. Um, Martin Luther is starting to say, hey, I don't like this. Right? I'm not a fan of this. And he starts to protest. He says, you guys got to be kidding me. How are you allowing the church to do this? So we're going to see what this indulgence thing actually looks like. Anyway, in the Middle Ages, there were simpler ways to be pardoned for your sins. Have you been naughty? 